Thank you, Jack. I appreciate the invitation to come. I have a first question is, how many of you know who Julius Fabo is? There you go. There you go. He's sitting right here, in front, right in front. And he was the first landscape architect I ever met. We met in uh, the Netherlands in, a long time ago. And, uh, <laughs> Another millennium. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, anyway, it's, you know, it's a real honor to come back to the University of Massachusetts. Uh, my daughter went here, so I'm proud of the place. And, um, and there's so many good people. I, I mean, I just met you know, Ethan Carr and Jack and Julius and uh, others and Kurt Griffin and uh, who else? It's Scott Jackson. And uh, favorite, one of my favorites is uh, going to Colorado. Uh, it's, um, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin McGarrigal. Yeah. And anyway, it's just a wonderful faculty you have here. It's a great place. And then you got this building. Can you imagine that? What a dream. I grew up in biology buildings. You know, they're all green and they're boring and everything. This is great. So, look, this is our topic here. By the way, I was just sitting there while he was talking. What's that thing that looks like a bird with a red head? Is that what? What is that? What is it? What she said? What she said? A what? Navigational. Looks like uh, light. Uh, light to me. It's, it's not a bird. It's not a bird on top of it. All right. Okay. I said I never looked at that slide very carefully. <laughs> I, I had lots of time to look at it. Okay. Look. Uh, so uh, our topic then is, as the title will say, says, is the, the land of towns and villages, and we'll focus in on towns and mainly. Um, but uh, I want you to think more broadly. And let me, let me suggest that this is a giant topic that we, by and large, overlooked and missed um, <coughs> that ecologists, let me say, have. And um, I know designers haven't. Uh, I've lived in about a dozen towns, I think. And, uh, but as, a, as an ecologist, as a scientist, then I, visualize, I always visualize towns as a place to get gas and have lunch. And, and that's all towns were good for, you know? That's my perception. And, and uh, if you want to read J.B. Jackson, I put a nice quote, long quote in, his, uh, in this book from his Optima City. Uh, and he, has, uh, he, he elaborates on that in great gory detail, in beautiful detail, I should say, uh, in the Midwest and the Southwest. Uh, so the, the land is peppered with towns and villages, and the land of towns and villages um, covers maybe half the globe. There's a, the urban suburban over here, and there's the remote natural lands over here, you know, tundras and what have you. Uh, and the intermediate zone, all the, as far as I can see, all the uh, cultivated land, crop land, um, maybe half, I don't know, maybe half of the pasture land f- falls into that little bit of forest. Some, portion of forest, a little bit of desert land falls in here. It may cover half the globe. I don't know, but that, that's my guess somewhere in there. And it uh, may contain 45% of the population, the, the global population. There's a lot of people out there. So um, it produces resources like fi- food and fiber, but it also produces clean water and recreational opportunity and biodiversity and so forth. So it's important. I'm going to define, for my purpose, our, our purposes today, I'm going to define a town as a uh, concentrated population of 2,000 to 30,000 uh, people surrounded by agricultural natural land and or natural land there. So I'm not talking about suburban towns, which are surrounded by suburbs or city. Uh, so I'm really talking about the rural world, where it's... That's the big world out there, big wide world out there. Um, so I have to tell you, say at the outset that this is sort of a frontier um, topic. I never, in working on it for three or four years, I never found a book on ecology of towns or villages, and I never found an article on that. So, uh, so having said that then, and you think about frontiers you, you were interested in, we don't know much. And so there will be uh, weasel words. There will be modifiers, like usually and normally and often and frequently and things like that. Because 
you know, the future will determine the confidence limits. Right now, we're in a very early stage. So, with that as an introduction, let's look. So, what I did was I went and I found out there weren't any books or articles on the subject, and I so then I accumulated a large amount of indirect literature, things that were really indirect, but they seemed to. Be, so, I had piles of that stuff. But at the end of that summer, it was just it was still. It was still nebulous. It didn't make sense. It didn't, didn't gel. And so I decided the way to go was I'm going to go visit towns. And I, in the next uh, years, I, I did that. And I, I determined there, there are 20-plus town types. And they, there they are there. And as I said, already said, I don't do much with some of these. I do more with others. But uh, so I decided that what I needed to do was to visit small to large examples of each of those. And that was a task. And so here's where I went. Um, there are 55 of those. Now, some of them are smaller, some are villages, and some are small cities at the other end there, but most of them are towns. And so it's, the goal was to get an international uh, coverage and to get small to large examples of all 20 of those types. And you can look in the book and see if, how well I did on that. So that's how I got my information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right. So given that variability, international all around the world, and a whole lot of different types, I kept saying, is there a, a spatial model for those towns? And this is what I came up with. And I think this actually works pretty well, again. Normally, or in most cases, or something like that, my, hedge, my hedging there. Because uh, I don't know enough. Nobody knows enough there. But anyway, this seems to work widely. And so, let's see, I've got to use the pointer now. And this pointer is not, a, not an overwhelming. All right, so, so here we have the... Um, I can't even see it. All right, see that dark area there in the middle? That's a uh, town center, and in the center of that is a plaza central or a, or a square, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the square is either just vegetation, walkways, or it has a prominent building, either a religious building or a government building in the center in almost all cases. And then the, the dotted area next to it is the older residential area, and it's always adjacent to the town center, which is mixed commercial Residential, sometimes industrial, the older industrial, but mainly um, residential uh, and commercial. So it's the, the town center, you're familiar. And uh, then the, big, the white area there is the newer residential, and that's made up of a number of sometimes many neighborhoods at different angles and different densities and so on. They're quite different, and I did, never found any literature. I decided I wouldn't try to evaluate the different neighborhoods present. But then there's an edge around the town, the irregular edge. And that's really important as a source of things going out and as a filter of things coming in and out. And uh, sometimes the this, this commercial area gets too small and too crowded. And so you need another commercial area. And so you build it out there on the edge. Sometimes you do that for industrial area. And I'll show you examples of those. There. So that... Oh. Did I, I, I missed that, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, so then right outside of the edge is a zone I call the adjacent zone, for a better <laughs> name, and it's, uh, it's, it's sort of two to a few kilometers wide, to give you a scale. And, and what it characterized is it's very intensively used in different ways, and the, the features in it are finer scale than beyond it, so there's smaller things in it. And then beyond that is the surrounding land out here, and the surround, here's the town. Surrounding land goes halfway to the next town, statistically at least. Um, in other words, here, this town has its zone of influence there. So that gives you a spatial model for towns there. Um, okay. So this is in the t center of town. This is the commercial, industrial, uh, commercial residential town center. It's a place of celebrations. It's a place of, of meetings and so forth. And um, 
This doesn't, I don't, I don't see the image on the, on the computer. If, if there's any easy way to fix that, it'd be great. So if, if not, don't worry about it. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so here's a case in southeastern Massachusetts of a town. I don't really know what town this is. I inherited this uh, image. And over to the right, and then a bypass highway, and the town needed to expand its commercial activity. So it built a shopping center up there with all those cars there. And notice to the, to the south and to the west there, a whole lot of little uh, uh, industrial buildings, a whole lot of little uh, business, uh, I mean, uh, f factories making things. And then later came along the apartment buildings up in the upper left, upper left, yeah. Uh, and I want to just emphasize that um, industrial park there, if you want to call it, industrial center there. That's really important, and I'm going to come back to that there. Oh, yeah, you got it. Well, it's Magic. It's stuck there for some reason. It's stuck. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, there. Let's go to the next one, see if the next one comes on. You want the next one? Yeah. I should have left well enough alone. So, so anyway, there, there is this, this structural... Uh, model, let's call it that, for towns there. And that's sort of a first cut. And these next two slides, if they show up, are in the uh, adjacent zone. And there's a zone, and the adjacent zone is things that require the proximity of people. So let's try the next one. Let's see what happens. Yeah, there you go. There, there's a, something, you know, a bunch of chickens, chickens, these mobile chicken things that you have to live near there. In other words, you can't put chickens 20 miles out, the fo out there, uh, there. And the dog is to keep the coyotes and the foxes away. Uh, it's fairly effective. And um, so th this is an example of something that would be in your um, adjacent zone. Here's another example. This is Machu Picchu. And there the towns. You can see the old towns here and here. And uh, the intensive irrigation. Irrigation has to be near where you live. You can't have irrigation way off there. It won't work. Um, because you need just so much water and not too much water over the whole zone. There. So those are examples. And there are lots of other examples. Orchards and, and vineyards and what have you. That you need to live nearby. And so they're very characteristic of the adjacent zone. Um, so now village. I don't can do much with villages here. There are two types of villages, as far as I can tell. One is a linear village like this, uh, mainly along a road, or sometimes along a, a, co a, a coastal area. And um, by, def by geographer's def definition, by the way, the, the 2,000 to 3,000, uh, that number comes mainly from geography. Um, there, there's, and it, you know, it's not absolute, of course. But... Um, in this case, by definition, there is a common building, one or more common buildings. And there's a church and way up there, pretty far up near where that curve is. And usually a linear, feet, linear village is, is located where there's a rise or there's a curve so that you don't see all the way through it like that. I mean, it's very typical of a village. Anyway, these people are exposed to wind and water and wildlife constantly. Every house, the whole village. The other type of village, similarly, is a compact or, a, or a, they call it, usually call it an enclosed village with a little village green. And um, it also is small enough that water and wildlife and storms and everything else uh, sweep through and you, you live with that. You live with those things. Now, a little bit later, I'm going to raise the question of the value of villages. It sounds really radical, but I have an interesting way to do that, and I'll show you. So, so here's a village on the left here in uh, the tropics, and um, it's this particular slide. That villagers harvest resources around them, and this is an example in a rainforest. The, the uh, white-faced capuchin, the uh, howler monkey, spider monkey, the guan, and so forth. Um, it, there are things that they eat that are big food. It's, it's not a protected area. Um, and so villagers tend to depend on resources in the surroundings. Um, flow of things, that's the structure. Everything I said, more or less, is structural. This is just to illustrate that 
the farmland is around it, and the tractors go through and distribute seeds and, and soil and uh, just debris. And uh, this is a, a thing about how you might design for wildlife movement. And uh, the basic idea, there are three concepts, in my judgment. This right here, or the gray, is high-quality habitat. And the white is low-quality habitat. There's some medium up there somewhere. And uh, so this is the best, and that's the second best, and that's the third best, and that's the fourth best. So you're designing around habitat quality and spatial arrangement. I mean, that's what landscape eco- ecologists and wildlife biologists have done forever. But the other two things are equally important. Avoidance. There are a bunch of things that, that uh, wildlife tend to avoid. And these are examples here. And the third one is attraction. There are things that attract wildlife. So in de- designing for wildlife movement across the land, there are really three things you need to, to put on your map <laughs> or keep, keep in, in, in uh, interest. And so villages and towns and roads and what have you uh, fit in here in a positive and uh, ne- mostly negative ways. Have you ever seen a map of flows? How many of you have ever seen a map of flows? Boy, this is a great audience. You're the smartest people I've ever run into. <laughs> I love it. A map of flows is really, really quite unusual. This is a very simple-minded map of flows. And this is, this is a work by um, Wagner and Merriam, an old work. And uh, that it's in southern Ontario where there are agricultural fields, there are hedgerows and there are woods, and there's nothing else. And so they simply watch the birds, bird, mammals, small mammals, and you see the big black air, a lot of movement between hedgerow and feet, woods. And less of, over there, a little bit, and in intermediate here. And then for birds, it's similar, a lot of movement between here and somewhat slightly different for the others. But So if you were after strategic points in the landscape, the, the big black areas, arrows, are the strategic points in the land. That's where, if you had limited money, that's brutal. <laughs> Put your money on those. That's, that's how you figure out strategic points, is where the flows are, sent, uh, are, are connecting things that are cr- crucial. Um, uh, here's another map of flows, a little different one. This is a town that I had been taking my students to for 25 years, and it's south-central Florida. And it's a very strange-shaped town. It's the purple. The purple is a town, and it's got a whole lot of sort of fake developments in it and real developments in it. But so it's a strange shape and it's because of all the lakes. Anyway, this is South Central Florida. The central third of this is a sandy ridge. In the right and the left are are wet soils that have been drained slightly. They go all the way off to the uh, Atlantic Ocean here and the Gulf of Mexico over there. And so I've mapped three things on here. The first is water. And it's water because in the sandy soil there is no surface runoff. It's all subsurface, you know, like a beach. It rains on the beach and <laughs> goes in. And uh, so you see this arrow right here go in the center. Blue arrow goes up to that lake and up to that lake up there, way up to the top, and it crosses a highway. There, a blue arrow crosses the highway, and it's a, there's a bridge on that highway, and there's soil on both sides of the bridge. And so the water... Water runs in that way, it goes in the big lake, and then over here it runs off toward the Atlantic, and it runs over here it runs off to the south and the Everglades. Um, so if you're going to do anything there, you better know which way the w- water's flowing. But this is ground groundwater mostly, although over here is a lot of surface water. Um, second thing that's mapped here: bears. Uh, and bear habitat is this big, this blob here, and that blob there, and there's another blob way up there. And you can see the dot, the dashed line. Dashed line goes up there, and then it goes on up, and it has to go a little bit through the town to get to that other woods. And then around here, it goes on up around, and it goes under that highway on an underpass there, so, uh, river, stream, stream, and the river. And then the third thing is the uh, uh, Florida panther, mountain lion, if you want. Uh, That's the big pink area down here, the habitat. 
And it works its way up in certain places up here around the edge of the town. So the bear goes into town a little bit, and the panther stays out of the town there. So those are, those are maps of flows, given the topography and the, lo the location of the town. Here's another flow map. Now, this is not ecology. This is culture. There's a map of culture, the flow, <laughs> the flow of culture. And the bo bottom line on this thing is that there are four types of towns that started in America. Number one, the New England village up there, and then the Middle Atlantic towns, the, um, the, the southern towns, C, in that there are two types, the deep south and the tidewater south, and then this uh, along here, the, the um, Hispanic towns uh, to the southwest. And what's interesting to me is to see those types that moving west. And, and then later, the Mormon uh, villages are something distinct that's different. Um, but anyway, this refers to the, the, the structure of the town center, the architecture, the language, the planning, the, um, and lots of other things that are tied into that, those arrows there and those places there. All right, change and shrinkage happen. And here's an example of where I used to live down here. Um, and, but this is a sudden change. But I want to say a few things first about before I go into this about change and shrinking. The, the population of the globe is growing, and it's expanding. The next billion people is due within 14 years. How many of you are going to be here when the next billion people get here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, another billion people, and you're going to be here. And some of you are going to have another billion after that, another billion after that. The UN data don't level off, unfortunately. Uh, so far, and um, they're all headed to cities, according to the UN and other data there. And um, so the question, a question is, is the future of America or future of the world everyone living in big cities? Now you might say, well, no, they live in towns and villages. And they say, well, I don't live. so now I want to put something, a bug in your ear and let's say that as far as I can tell, I'm not a geographer, that in every continent, villages are decreasing in population on average by quite a bit. And in every continent, towns are slightly decreasing in population. It may not be significant, but it, it, it's there. there. So what's that mean? All the new people, all the new people, you know, they, they, it's not as if they're coming from another planet, but the increased population growth is, gonna, is centered on cities. Villages are shrinking. And towns are sort of in between. They, they're not quite holding their own on, on average. Um, so maybe the future that the, the, you know, those of you that raised your hand is, is the beginning of a planet where everybody lives in a big city. Um, so let me say a little bit more about this village shrinking. There is a term in Spain that's called empty Spain. Empty Spain refers to a big area of central and a little bit north and a little bit east there where everybody has moved to the, to the city, Madrid, Barcelona, and so on. And so on. They come back on weekends, but, but they basically moved out. The flyover Midwest is a little bit like that. It's, that has a little different connotation. But the one I really like is, the dark, is Russia, the dark encroaching forest. Now, those of you know something about the history of Russia and Brothers Karamazov and those sorts of things, uh, know that Russia is a, is a huge area of, of some, a few cities and a zillion villages and very few towns, not many towns. It's a, it's a village thing, and so on. Anyway, so the villages are decreasing in population. I got data from one province that starts with a P. It's near, between Moscow and St. Petersburg, but I don't remember the name of it. And uh, in this province, the um, schools are closing. The population, the people are, the young people are going to the city. Those are all typical kinds of things. The old people are dying. And all the maternity wards in the province have closed. And what really drives it home to my way of thinking is, what the, according to these authors, the, the general store in the village mainly sells vodka 
and small amounts of groceries. Now, think of that. The dark encroaching forest is evil in Russia. That's, that's, the, that's what, the, if they had to push that thing back. Uh, so, uh, Russia is, is an extreme, I think. But I think the pattern is broader, broad, broad scale. Um, shrinkage, stability. So, as far as I can tell, towns don't want to be a city, and they definitely don't want to be a village there. So, I'm going to now show you some things. So, now let's talk about change. change. So, the, here's a place in the Caribbean island, center of a town, Right in the center of the town, there's the, the central market is right down behind where I'm taking this picture, and that that devastation there was caused by a hurricane 12 years ago, and 12 years later, right in the center of town, you can see a damaged building, you can see a building was wiped out here, you see ecological succession has taken over, uh, so things happen quickly, but towns don't have much money. That's different than cities. Cities have money. Um, the, the, I almost never found a wealthy neighborhood in a town. I found it one or two or a few wealthy houses, homes, but I never, almost never found a wealthy neighborhood in a town. That's really an interesting uh, thing. All right, so now I want to t take time in a, in a little different context. This is a Chinese village of 1,500 people. And this, it's near Lake Tai, Lake Tai, uh, which is southwest of Shanghai and southeast of Nanjing. And uh, th so there are the houses, the white little squares and the black little squares of the shops. And you notice there's a school down here, the stream going through, rice culture mainly around it. And, um, and then notice over here, there's this cooperative silk factory. Villages generally don't have factories. In fact, some geographers say that's, a, that's the way you tell a village from a town, where there's a factory. So this is a little bit unusual, have a, have a factory there, and it becomes important. This village has experienced terrible droughts and terrible floods and terrible... Um, oh, what's that insect that kick that wipes it, eats everything? Um, you know, grasshopper. But, Locust. What? Locust swarms, terrible locust swarms that, that wipe out, eat all the greenery, 100%. Uh, but that's happened over history. That's happened over and over. The people have adapted to those things. Big drought, big flood, big locust devastations. And so they figured out what to do. I mean, it's like we, a farmer who knows that winter is coming. You know, you store up some things and do things. And um, so they've adapted to that. But... So they, they don't worry too much, according to the person who wrote this, who's a leading uh, British-Chinese scholar. Um, what they worry about, what the people in this village really worry about, is something that they'll never see. It's something that's way off. It's in the cities. It's industrial development. It's modernization. It's lowering the price of silk, and that it's going to put their factory out of business. That's what they worry about. And they've never hit that before. It's like us and climate change. We've never run into that before. We're not old enough. We're only 50 years old or however old we are. Uh, we've never run into that. In other words, we haven't adapted to it. In the biological sense, adaptation means you've experienced things and learned from it there. Um, so that's what these people worry about. And um, it turns out that... In this village, the village got wiped out by something that they'd never run into also, but it was different. It got wiped out by an invading army in the 1930s there. And um, it doesn't exist anymore, although the very nice book about it does exist. All right. So here's a town up in the main, the, 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 the pulp mill. So you know the smell of the pulp mill, paper mill? You don't forget it once you've experienced it, and then the pollution goes down the stream also. That's right, actually, in the center of, of Rumford, Mexico. Um, here's a town uh, that, uh, Superior, small town, uh, that's, you know, it's got empty storefronts, and empty storefronts means that the 
main in, uh, employer has gone out of business. In this case, a co- copper mine, about a couple hours southeast of Phoenix. A uh, copper mine closed, and that's what the town looks like. Um, and if the town looks like that, it's also got abandoned houses, and ecological succession takes over, and, and it goes on. Now, remember I showed you that slide of the southeastern Massachusetts infrared slide, southeastern Massachusetts. So here's an example of that from the ground. This is in, this is in England. Uh, and that's a small industrial park. And, you know, you can count four or five uh, small industries in that park. And that's the kind of thing that suggests stability or a future. That's what I look for when I go into a town or a village there. If you had one big company, then it's like the big pulp mill up there in Newfoundland, or it's like the, the, the um, zinc factory in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. Or, and it's a company town. And there's a literature on public. good book. There are very interesting books on company towns. Very interesting. And most of them are just devastating books, they're awful books. I mean, they're awful stories. But there are some. I've been in two towns that I would say the, ta- the company was really benevolent, ta- really cared about the people. And one of them is um, in Street Somerset, England, it, where they make the Clark Shoes. The Clark Shoe Company it was a very <coughs> benevolent company, and they, they made parks, and they really helped their employees. The other is Sandvik in Sweden, where the, is the computer company for Sweden. There, same thing. So company towns don't have to be bad, but the history of them mainly is that. So this one town. Um, so now what we're going to give you... So... so in terms of the, the loss of population in villages and t- in towns particularly, this would be something that can counteract that. So if one of these industries folds, there's still four going on. They may be able to replace that one there. A company town doesn't have that stability. You, know, you, you, gain the mo- you don't put all your eggs in one basket, but, but if you have two baskets, you gain a lot in risk, risk spreading. If you have three baskets, you also gain, not quite as much, but you gain... But you don't gain much after about four or five, statistically. There's not much gain at that point. Um, so that's one way to get stability. Now, here's another interesting way. This is a town that I take my students to, took my students to for a week a few years ago. It's an hour south of Albuquerque, desert. Desert all the way around. The, the beige stuff is desert. The Rio Grande River comes down there next to us, Socorro. It's an old town, Spanish town, started in 1600 or 1598. And um, so the red is the central square, I mean, is, is the, uh, plaza, the commercial building and so on. But what I want to tell you about this relative stability is the following. The first six, so we, we worked here for a week. You know, we worked with the government people and the ranchers and some real estate people, all kinds of stuff, Chamber of Commerce. And the first six people I met in this town, <coughs> all adults, five of them said that they had been in this town multi-generations. In other words, their grandparents, maybe more, had been in this town, the five of them. The sixth woman said, no, she wasn't from this town. She was from the next town, Belen. And her family had been in that town for three generations. Now think about that. Six, the first six people of all multi generation in the town. I tried that out on my on the people in my town in the suburb of Boston. And it was zero. Nobody <laughs> fit that. And but what it meant was that they the the mothers and fathers that ran that town are planning for the next generation. In other words, they grew up there and their parents grew up there, and they are going to help provide for the next generation. So. Kids don't disappear to the city. They go to the city, but then they come back. And then one example I'll give you is right up... Uh, oh, it doesn't show on here, I guess. Uh, was a, yeah, A, up there, Apartments by Park. They have a new park, a new uh, grassy park, a lot of playgrounds, a little bit of ball fields. And right next to it, on two sides of it, are apartments that are being built, or had been built. There's still more were being built. And... Um, what that means is they know that the young people are going to go to the city for opportun- educational and job opportunities. But when the young people maybe have young families, 
and they want to come back, but it's too expensive. They, play. they have provided apartments right next to where the young children can play there. And that's an example of the mothers and fathers planning specifically to bring the next generation back for stability there. So that, that's a, just another example I'm trying to give, and, and you could probably think of other ways to make better towns, more, more st- towns that are going to persist. Now, everything I said about these is, is towns, what happens in the town. I want to say something about what happens outside the towns when they shrink. And this is in central Italy. And um, so there are five towns and villages up there. And the, you can see the curve, population curves over time. And what I'm going to focus in on is the last 30 years, from 78 to 2010, roughly. And um, so what I've done is I, these other graphs around here, I've plotted different land uses. And what you can see in the last 30 years, when all five of the towns are, and villages are decreasing, they're all shrinking, this is what happens to the land around them. Up there at the top, it says that the cropland and grassland, that means pasture land, and the shrubland decrease. And what these two say is that woodland increases. There's just different ways of measuring it. Uh, so what that means is the towns are decreasing and the intensive use things like croplands and, and cows are decreasing with the towns. The forest is increasing. So that's that dark encroaching forest of, our, of Russia. But here's another way of thinking about that if you don't want to think about Russia. That's an example of land restoration. That's restoring the land. You're closing the the village is down. They're decreasing in population. And that's an increasing natural, natural forest. Now, uh, you know, that's a kind of a radical way of thinking. But you might think about that. Nature restoration, that's what happens when you close villages down. So now I put that thing on the table at the beginning. Is, do we want villages? Or do we want everybody living in big cities? Or do we want villages, towns, and cities? Or do we want just villages and towns? And we could talk about that. That's an interesting subject. Anyway, so here we are in Massachusetts, central Massachusetts. This is, it says 1850 there. This is the Harvard Forest. Uh, I would say it was more like 1860, but that's all right. Um, the, idea, the idea is that the people headed off to, to Ohio in the 1850s, 60s, uh, where it had good soil and didn't get rid of this miserable soil we live in. And um, so the farms began to regrow. And that's an example of what I've just been talking about right here in Massachusetts. All right. Ecology and towns. Now, Lisa, um, you know, you had such a long talk. I'm going to need another 10 minutes or more. <laughs> um, so here we are. So now, as I say, some scattered disjunct things about the ecology in a town. And by, by way of uh, preamble, there are a whole lot of small impervious surfaces, the, the name of, like roofs of houses and little narrow sidewalks and things like that. There are almost, except the central uh, commercial area, there are almost no large uh, uh, impervious surfaces. Um, the soil is pervious. There's a lot of plant cover. There's a negligible heat island, as far as I can tell. I couldn't find any data on that. Um, ch- chemicals are everywhere. Um, High water table, relatively high water table in most towns, unlike cities where you've pumped, you know, you've pumped it for industry and other things. Um, there's a big species rain, you know, the idea that the, the nature or agriculture is near and species that just keep coming in. Animals run in, seeds come in, butterfl- uh, spiders parachute in. Uh, tends to be relatively luxurious, luxuriant vegetation in towns. Um, and think about the fact that mo- m- most towns, probably, um, the, uh, the newer residential area, it was on former agriculture. Therefore, there's a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil. Therefore, plants grow like crazy in the newer residential areas there. Um, habitat clusters. Uh, I'll tell you something about that. And the flows in and out of town. So this is... And this is in the center of a town. This, I'm standing in the, actually the town center here, uh, the Plaza Central in a Swedish town. And what are, two things I want to show you. One is here that it, a city has 
uh, infrastructure usually goes down 10 meters. And, you know, you have all kinds of things going on down there. Whereas in a town, it's within the top two meters. In other words, it's easily accessible. You can get it for repair. Water main breaks, you, it's easy to get to. Uh, the second thing is it's 100% sand and gravel. It's all entirely sand and gravel in, the, in this area for good reasons, for drainage reasons. Um, here's Pompeii, uh, Italy. <laughs> Old Roman town with the Roman road there, the big flat stones. The reason I put this up is, notice the pipes. Those are the water pipes. And they're made of lead. And the Romans, all their water pipes, according to a Roman historian I met, uh, all their water pipes were made of lead. So you can think about that, knowing the effects effects of lead. Uh, Here's a, a, a mine. There are a lot of mining towns. And it's a big mine. That's, that's a quarter of a mile across this, that mine, and it's in the in in the city limits, uh, the town limits of uh, uh, Falun. Uh, this is a very strange picture, but my illustrator and I had lots of fun trying to how to illustrate this. The idea here is that trees have an effect on the atmosphere, and the atmosphere has an effect on the trees. You know, it's not too radical, but it's still interesting. So on the left, trees adding chemicals, pollutants, right, trees removing them. And so over here, you've got, you know, here's some things that are positive, like, like pollen for fruit, but then it's negative, it's bad, pollen for human allergens, and the VOC emissions, and so on. There's some that are good, like the phytoncides, you know, the things that, that, that give you health. Uh, and then, they, uh, then there's some bad ones. And it's the same thing. The, the bottom line is that you can choose the trees you're going to plant or let grow in your yard, in your town, and that has an effect on, this, on the air quality there. And these are examples of that, with some actual trees in the literature there. Fight insides are those things that, uh, you know, the idea of... Um, uh, forest bathing. It's the phytoncides that are providing the benefits there. There are things like humulene and, and pinene, and, and there, there are a bunch of them that are good for your health there. Apparently. But I would, I would just caution you on that. Most of that literature comes from Japan, and, and a lot of literature. I, I mean, I've seen 30, 35 reference, serious references. But... Um, most of it has to do with uh, cupressus. What's the common name of this? Uh, cypress. Cupressus? Yeah. Cypress and maybe pine. But in other words, most of the literature seems to be coming from two conifers, uh, particularly cupressus there. So I just think, you know, I've talked to ex- experts and I say, in the woods uh, out here, would, would we get health benefits like this in walking? And they always say yes, but they. It's never compelling to me. So anyway, you might, you might, you might. Well, I mean, I'm not talking about uh, exercise and that kind of stuff, but the, just the chemicals that are coming from the trees. Yes, I think we need. Uh, here's one of those pla- little places in empty Spain. This little town has eight population 89. Used to have a population of a few thousand, but all the people come back. Many of the people come back from Madrid on weekends, and so they have a brand new pl- uh, playground in the center park there. And, and everybody knows each other. They keep the apartments in town, bill- buildings up. Notice that the stream is not buried. Streams are buried in cities. Towns don't bury them. They either tolerate the stream or they treasure the stream. There, uh, a real interesting difference between towns and, and cities. Here's a town in Alberta. And I just show this because you can see these long squiggly things. That's parkland, but they are also uh, stream corridors. And so what they, they haven't buried those streams. If they buried them, probably they'd be all cut up in pieces. So the parkland is continuous because they kept their streams. Uh, Some place in Europe, Portugal, uh, where you have st- cut stone. And that just it slows the velocity of stormwater runoff, and there's a little bit of imp- uh, uh, infiltration, especially in light rains, there decreased flood a little bit. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm not going to say anything intelligent about uh, human wastewater here, but what I would ask you to do is, if you're interested in a town, ask people how 
human waste is taken care of. Human waste. And in some cases it becomes human waste war, sometimes not. Uh, and what you'll find is, that, first of all, it's very hard to get information, good information. And second of all, you'll find that there are all kinds of ways it's done. There are a lot of ways it's done. It's not just sewage versus septic. There are lots of, lots of ways that, in practice, it's done. Um, so I'm going to skip that. that. Um, so this is, a, this is a, near that Socorro, New Mexico desert area. And I just kind of like this because, the, the, you know, deserts have flash floods where, where you have huge rain, usually when the hills and mountains way up there. It doesn't rain on you. But all of a sudden, it comes so he- heavy that it, it doesn't sink in. Instead, it goes washing over the surface and blocks roads and things like that. And so here's a bridge for those things. The other reason I like this is that you see how it's got the pillars, but it's also got sloping up like that. And for a deer, uh, or for any wildlife, going through an underpass... By the way, I live in a town... The next time you drive to Boston on Route 2, you know, good old Route 2, go through the town of Concord, and you hate it. You hate it because there are a whole lot of stoplights there. You know, you, it's just miserable. There's a circle, too. It's terrible, dangerous. But you should know, Scott knows this, uh, but there are five wildlife underpasses under Route 2. So we are, you're sitting there fighting that traffic and those red lights. The animals are scurrying back and forth. They love it, you know. They're just, you, know you guys are dumb. You're out there sitting in a traffic jam. We're having fun down here. There are five of them. So anyway, the thing I like about this is that the, the angle of those that then gives a wide perspective at eye level for the animal, for the deer at least there. And that's good. The wider it is because you slow down when you come to a, a boundary until you can see whether there's danger on the other side. And that's the wider it is, the better for an underpass. Let's get to that. Um, here's another one. This, the, the, so those of you interested, this is an il, a reasonable illustration of something that in the literature is called a home garden, and that's one word, home garden. And it's a very interesting literature. A lot of it comes out of Indonesia, some South Africa, Brazil, some other places. Uh, and the idea is the following. We have sprawl in our North American world where a, house, a low-density house has a big yard. This is the same density of housing. It's, it would be called sprawl if you just went by housing and, and density. But what they do, instead of having grass to mow, they cover it with useful plants. The, whole, the bulk of the area is useful plants, medicine, food, and so on. So here's, you can see the banana here in the center, mango in the upper left, the papaya. Where's papaya coming up here? There were maybe piña there, and maybe a few other plants in there. But they also have some shrubs so that are showy. And so the idea of a home garden is when the government budgets go down, and they do, you know, they go up and down, when they're down, this family has a little bit of stability because they have food growing at different levels, the chickens running around, and the whole yard is food-producing. And so they get through those really tough times when the, when the national economy or regional economy is poor. Well, that's just a strange picture. <laughs> uh, uh, lichens and mosses are not very common in cities. They're always present in towns. Um, this is a community garden. I just put this up the, to illustrate one concept, the concept of, of a uh, habitat cluster where you have a whole lot of habitats clustered together, concentrated together. And a habitat cluster, so each of these is a little microhabitat, each family that's growing things, uh, so that in a small area, you've got a very high biodiversity, the habitat cluster concept. Another example, a very interesting example people don't think about much, is that is a house lot. A house lot has got a whole lot of little microhabitats in it. You know, tree area here, foundation, planting a lawn, whatever, vegetable garden. And another really interesting one, even more interesting in some ways, is a block, a block composed of many house plots. Each house plot is different. 
And so the block, in effect, is a habitat cluster there. And uh, I have to keep going. There's wildlife out there. And uh, the birds and the squirrels around that feeder are probably quite quiet at this moment when that picture was taken there. Um, so th- this is an image, a, a schematic, a hypothesis. Actually, my students call this a formanism. <laughs> Uh, so the goal here is to figure out where do wildlife come into towns and go out. And um, so the town is the gray area here, and you'll see stream quarter and railroad quarter and the, and the green wedge are obvious ways of getting into the town, in some cases going all the way through the center of town. And then these things over on the right are land uses on the outside adjacent to the town, and uh, very few of those are common for wildlife to go in. Forest land would be a good example of going in. And then on the left are a whole lot of things just inside the edge. And again, there are not many of those that are, are really good for wildlife going in and out. But a single family home maybe is one. And then there are a few things like railway corridor, highway corridor, river and stream, again, that are parallel to the edge. That some of those are good places for wildlife to come in, go out, and others aren't. There, so it's it's a first cut, and it's trying to get at the idea of what you could do uh, to encourage it or de- discourage it. <laughs> gene flow, gene flow happens across the landscape. There's a couple of amphibians this is Spain, and the basic uh, bottom line here is uh, I think there are about eight villages and towns uh, from north to south here. And there's some main roads going across, uh, um, only two lane, most of them are two-lane roads, and those are partial barriers. But this, according to the investigators in this study, uh, the, really, the thing that, was, that caused, um, that inhibited gene flow, hence movement, was the network of fine-scale roads between the main roads. That, that was the thing, that how dense that road density, how, the road density of local roads between the main roads there. It's a very interesting study. Um, oh, this is fascinating. This is important. I, I love this. So here, this is light, night light, artificial night light. So here's a street lamp. By the way, a lot of this data comes from Germany, where really good work has been done. Street lamp, habitat, flying insects at night, goes around, 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 and about a third of them die. Some of them, they die by hitting the light, hot light. Some, some of them go around and around and they fall down to the ground, exhausted. Some of them fall down to the ground, they get eaten, and some of them get eaten by predators up there. And about a third of them die. Now, that is when there's a light sky, clear moon. Suppose you had a dark sky. Notice this. Here's your habitat. There's this going across. But notice this is ten times further than that over there. And this is so much happens here, they call it the technical term is the vacuum cleaner effect, where you suck insects, flying insects, out of the habitats and kill them over here, there. And the lights that are most devastating for that, oh, you might say, oh, great, not so many mosquitoes. Well, it's not mosquitoes, they're drawing out. They're they're drawing out moths and beetles and aphids and and, um, flies. Uh, and they actually they've drawn all 12 major uh, order, insect orders, orthopod orders. But um, the, um, this, this, this food, this insect food, is food for all, almost all vertebrates. Not all, but almost all. You know, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals. So sucking that out is degrading this habitat. And the, the solution is a bright light on the edge of town. There's not The bright light in the center of town doesn't matter so much because there's so much light around already. A bright light on the edge of town matters a lot. That's the big vacuum cleaner effect there. All right, that's not fun, but that's... Um, oh, boy. Hey, you, anybody here ever heard of a Broadway play called The Bell of Amherst. There we go. We got five people, six people. 
The Belle of Amherst was a Broadway play. It was a, it was a single woman actress who brought this play. And, the, and part of the gist of it was, Emily loves birds. Her sister loves cats. <laughs> that was, that was just, I mean, there's more to the play than that. But, but, uh, but uh, go, go, go look it up. <laughs> anyway, um, so let me, let me tell you my, my bottom line. These are, these are town, village issues, not city issues, really. Uh, and I want to tell you, that I'm gonna, what I, my feeling, by the way, lead, a, a key leading ecologist at the University of Wisconsin years ago published an article studied the cat effects on predation on small mammals and birds. They kill a huge number of small mammals and birds. Huge number. This man concluded that you should keep your cats indoors. And he got death threats. So this is non-trivial. Um, so anyway, about a third of the people in uh, houses in America have cats. So I put down six houses here along this street. And then it, here's a very rough number for the home range of, of cat, a female and male cat. I, I just couldn't find good data on the home range of house cats. Which, uh, they've got to be out there right now. Anyway, and so I put it next to a in forest interior, forest edge. If you, let, if you let a male cat go out at night, it'll go a lot further. The male cat will go much further. So the only place... Oh, just I shouldn't get into cats. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they kill a huge number of uh, the cats. And, and, uh, small mammals, a little bit more than birds, but both of them are not much else, except in Brazil. Um, so, but... They also do it where houses are, and there are house mice in England, dormice, and there are house sparrows. So they're killing a whole lot of house mice, and how, and which owe their existence to the houses, and the people, and this extra food. Um, now, they also kill common suburban backyard species. You know, they kill those, too. But all of these species can multiply ample fast and... and it's not affecting the population size significantly, I think. Very few cases could I find a species of conservation concern that had been killed by a house cat. There are a few. I cited a few in the book, but hardly ever. So the only place I think, this is a formanism, the only place I think cats are a real ecological problem is where you have a bunch of houses next to a nature reserve, and they go past the... In- Woodland edge. They go into the interior, and I can see they could have an impact there on some uncommon uh, small mammals. And all right, now for dogs, it's the story's worse, uh, much worse. The cats are not a big problem, except for that one case, I think. Uh, for dogs, they scent mark by urine and, and waste, dog waste, um, and uh, wildlife know that. And um, one probably doesn't matter, but it repeated encounter of that, wildlife are going to go away. I mean, wildlife is a big word. I realize that. But, and so what, you, what we do when we walk our dogs in the forest, uh, we do two things. One is the bird, the animal sees the dog and goes an alert mechanism, you know, hormonal change. And if you keep coming, then it flushes. It goes away. And there's a lot of literature on flushing distances. And uh, the second thing, though, which I think is a lot worse, is the repeated scent marking, which renders habitat quality poor for a lot of wildlife there. And that's, so this, this is a solution here or there. Um, so I'm going to keep going. Species, uh, so what I, so now the, this is a way of thinking of the interaction between town and surroundings. And the big black arrows, I'm going to go, the big black arrows say that there's a whole lot of interactions into the adjacent zone here and into this surrounding area there, and almost none. I have zero, but there are a few things I've learned since out here. But no, and that, that those are mainly human driven. See that? Human driven. And the, going the other direction, the same similar amounts of flows going into the town. But they're a mix of human and natural forces, processes, really. 
So then let me end with some things on the better towns. So I'm, let me just re- read a few. I'll show you a few pictures here. Um, suppose you, flood, uh, floods are characteristic of towns. Suppose there was a, you emphasized flood mitigation at the town level rather than getting the government to do it. Um, suppose you started you you could start building your house after all the infrastructure was in and approved there. You couldn't start ha- hammering a single w- board until all the infrastructure was approved. That's the way it is in parts of England and Australia. There. Remove low usage roads, such as here's a nature area, one road going through it, not used very much. Close it or remove it. <laughs> there. That would have a big impact. Have wildlife crossing structures, like what I said. Arch shaped culvert, <coughs> culverts. Those of you that know. You love culverts. The, the best ones, as far as we can tell, are arch-shaped ones which prevent, provide stream-bottom habitat and some area on the, for terrestrial animals to move. And eliminating that bright lights. And everybody has convenient forest bathing. You know, so you can all go out and bathe in the forest. That's good. All right, so a few pictures. Oh, with that one. That one oh, boy. Sorry. That, there's... Um, this is down in the Caribbean, um, and that little van right there, I took that van one time, I've taken it a few times, um, they, pu- they pack in 18 people, rarely 20, but they pack it, and they pack it in, they drive like crazy like this, all over, and go all through the town, all through the, the, the surroundings, and it's very cheap, very cheap. And there's a, you know, there's a transportation mechanism. Um, Suppose you had people coming into your town. They, you know, they come down a hill, or they come. They come into town too fast. This is a way of slowing them down. <laughs> there, you could, uh, and people slow down for two ways. One is curves, uh, where they can't see around, so there's lots of curves there. And the second is the perceived uh, width of the road ahead. So if it's per- it doesn't have to be wa- it doesn't have to be narrow. But they have to think it's narrow there. So you can use lines and various ways of making them think it's narrow ahead. They'll slow down. So these are good for parks. These are good for the entrances to towns and villages and so forth. Um, lots of different ways of tr- local transportation that are greenhouse gas friendly. Um, close the center of town. Uh, this is nice because there's several squ- square blocks of, of pedestrian only, and they have three... Two, two parking garages and one open parking area right around it. So everybody can come and park right next to them, this pedestrian-only shopping area and so on. Um, modeling. is Simple spatial modeling is my favorite. So here's a town, and there are four villages, and they're connected by a road. In this particular simulation, you're going to add 12 houses, not in a town or village. Where's the best place to put them? Where's the worst place? That's all that is. Very simple thing to do. Uh, you could do it for all kinds of stuff. And you could say, well, for what? For animal, wildlife habitat, for wildlife movement, or both, or something else. Uh, sc- a lot of scattered uh, towns and villages and desert. This is a favorite of mine. Some of you have probably seen this before, but I'll go to it anyway. So th- this will solve, the, wor- solve the, land- the problems of the world, by the way. So this is, you know... You- <laughs> Upper left, top, there. The world is made up only of town, uh, only of nature, natural land, and roads and villages. P is a village. And so there are, I think, 20 P's up there, and they're connected. So that then has fragmented nature and con- connected ta- villages, okay? So now let's go to the right, upper right, top right. Now what we've done, we've got the same number of P's and N's and so forth, but what we've done is we've put all the nature over there and we've added a city, two towns, and, and village. So we've aggregated people into different uh, size populations on the right. There. That's better. And so there's, that's what it is. Um, and by the way, the city provides all kinds of things that the others don't provide, you know, from museums to, to orchestras and so forth different housing situations, different jobs, and so on. Uh, so now you say, well, that's too simple. You know, nature and city, cities and towns, the world's, we've got to have food. So let's put in some agriculture. So here in the middle left, we've added agriculture 
on alternate squares or tri triangles, di di diamonds, then above. And there you get fragmented nature, but dispersed farmland. Farmers don't like that. I've interviewed them. And then over to the right, you say, all right, well, then we'll move all the nature over there, all the agriculture here next to the housing, uh, next to the people. That's better. But wait, we've got to have water to drink. Let's put in a river system here. And over here, you can see the problems. It's not so good going through agriculture and gets all sedimented. And you come over here, and that's the future of the world. That's the optimum for the world. There you go. You solved all the problems. We've got people in different population sizes. We've got nature. We've got agriculture. We've got water. What else do you need? Well, if you want to put something else in, you can continue. But that way of modeling is a very simple visual thing that the mayor and the governor and various academics can understand. Uh, an edge park. Another thing, I've, I've stayed a night in this town, a town like this, and, um, and what I have to tell you before I explain the park is that it is in Spain, in, in Barcelona, and um, towns get their money, not much from taxes of citizens, but they get their money from development. So if the town can develop out here, industrial or commercial, they get a lot of money. If they do it commercial, uh, residential, they get some money. And so they know that on the outskirts, they're get, that's going to be developed over there. There's no question. That's the only source of money over there. So here is a 50-meter wide park, edge park uh, there. And by the way, this is real. You know, four stories on the edge of a town in Italy or Spain. The old place where you have restaurants and churches and buy postcards. And uh, the, first 30, the first 15 meters here, I've, I've seen something like this, um, is the classic European allee, you know, with the two, the, the, the two uh, plane trees. It's the thing that ties Europe together, culturally, uh, uh, there. And um, so the, the old men sit on the bench there and meet people, and the younger people push to their prams and, and talk, and it's a place to me, it's an amenity. And then 35 meters here, here, there's a series of outdoor rooms. So here's a little playground. See, my, she, my illustrator put those in. I, I don't know what they are, but they look like giant ants to me. And I'm happy. She, she, I give her free reign. Uh, and then there's a basketball court, a little soccer field. I went out and played soccer with the boys there. And some other things there. And there are a whole bunch of, if you're interested, that's all published. There, there are a lot of benefits to that edge park. Um, this is neat. This is... Um, this is the Green Divide idea in Germany, uh, Christine von Haaren. The Green Divide idea is the following. Up top, those light gray areas are community. They're towns and villages. I'm almost finished. <laughs> I see this is going to peter out. Uh, towns and villages. And in Germany, they have the concept of preventing coalescence of community. That's the term that I've been told they use. And that's the green divide or the black or the dark lines that are cut through so that they can't combine. So that there's a, they maintain their identity and their uniqueness there. And that's very important. And here's a blow up of exa example of one. There's the town up there. Here's the village. There's a village and here's the green divide. And the green divide has a whole lot of land uses. It's not put aside for nature. It does have some nature. It has some orchards. It has some view, view, viewing places. And so on. So there's another solution. Oh, well, there's a Massachusetts. I better do that. Uh, Massachusetts one. This here's the Concord, that center town that you go through with all those stoplights and those under those happy wildlife scurrying between. Um, so that town. Um, <laughs> you know what they did? They they made a they. They asked all the citizens, what are the ways we interact with other towns, both positively and negative? Uh, we fight with this town about an airport. We collaborate with this town on an elderly housing or with a high school. Or we, we fight with a bunch of towns about Route 2 and, and things. So, no, all the ways, all the towns. And when they did that and they plotted it up, they found that almost all their interactions were with 16 towns around them. And there they are. They call that a town-centered region. And, uh, you know, there are other ways of doing regions, and this is better. And it doesn't take any 
um, votes away. It doesn't take any financial part away, any political power away. But uh, so they did this plan. They plotted, they plotted vernal pools. They plotted this is large, large open areas. I think they plotted rare species. They plotted rivers and streams, uh, hiking trails. I mean, uh, walking trails, bikeways, and things like that. And and so from those plots of this little region, they could make an intelligent plan for that cent- town-centered uh, town. And uh, and then at the end, they gave these data sets and the plans to all 16 towns. So they have to do theirs, according to state regulations. And they would use our, our maps there and our data sets there. So it was a way of... of influencing the surroundings and neutrally influencing and learning from it there. Uh, so a town-centered region, that's what we call it. Uh, finally, uh, I think this is my next last slide, I, in going to those 55 towns, I hardly ever saw um, solar panels. You know, in one town I see one, next town zero, next town three. There just weren't many solar panels in towns and almost none in villages. What an opportunity for making better towns. Uh, I heard, almost never saw green roofs. There's a little electric car I rented, and the door go, front door goes up like that. It's really, um, uh, those, I just didn't run into those things. And think about that as an opportunity. Finally, on um, Isla Pascua, or, or Easter Island, here's, those are those moai, the, the big statues that next their backs to the sea, and villages were right on the this side of them. Anyway, notice that big green park there. This is right between the town, Hangaroa, and the sea. And it's a park for cultural reasons, but it's also mainly because the tsunamis come from the north, come, come from that direction. So this is a tsunami protection zone there. And there's a sign right over on the left here, off the slide, the sign is about this big, and it shows a hill like this, and so somebody's just running like crazy going up, and it says, tsunami, go that way, or something like that. Like, like that. Uh, so this is getting at that disturbance. They have adapted. They know what to do. They have set this aside up uh, in face of big disturbance. So uh, with that, let me just conclude that town ecology is a... A real frontier. You can tell I'm pushing the envelope all, repeatedly, not based on a whole lot of data, but a whole lot of ideas and hypotheses that need tests. It's a great subject for teaching. It's a, it's a great subject for learning classes and for research. And I thank you very much. <laughs>